for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one. Night story. Nightmare. A story based on a poem, Revolt of the Machines, by Stephen Vincent Benet. Nobody knows exactly when the nightmare began. They must have planned it for years, though, because looking back, you can find little incidents here and there. Like the concrete mixer in New Jersey that killed the Italian bricklayer. And the time Senator Milburn was sucked into the roto press at the Capitol office building. Unrelated accidents, we thought at the time. But they add up now. The day we really should have suspected was when the men walked off the construction job at the new Brook Meadow atomic pile on Long Island. I'll never forget that day. I was working as a statistical clerk in the project then operating one of those miracle computing machines. They called it ENIAC. Mr. Gurney. Yes, Bella? The chief wants to see you in his office. Me? Unless you were no longer Samson Gurney, he wants to see you. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Hawk? Uh, Gurney, I thought those electronic computations were infallible. They are, sir, but... We've got uh, a kickback from the chief physicist. These nuclear fission equations are inaccurate. Well, sir, you know the computer is a highly complicated machine, more complicated in many ways than the human brain. I'm not interested in the physics of it. Uh, can something go wrong? Well, occasionally, if there's an overload, the machine goes haywire. Sort of has a nervous breakdown, you might say. We usually rest it up for an hour, and it's okay again. Well, do whatever has to be done. Yes, sir. And, uh, Gurney. Yes, sir? You've been with the Bureau for over 15 years now. It would be a shame to have to remove you because you aren't keeping your mind on your work. Mr. Hawk, I assure uh, you... Excuse me. Uh, Hawk speaking. What? They've what? All of them? Well, have you tried to talk to them? Huh. Oh, yes, of course. Now, I'll send one of the safety engineers over. Place is falling apart piece by piece. Miss Roscoe, the men of the construction gang of the new building have walked out on us. They're complaining that the job is jinxed. Someone slipped this morning and fell into a turban. That evening, out of that morbid curiosity so peculiar to the human race... I wandered over to the side of the new atomic pile to see where the man had fallen into the turbine. They had the construction area fenced off with barbed wire, and a security guard stopped me. Hold it, buddy. You can't go in there. That's a restricted area. Oh, uh, I'm uh, Samson Gurney from the statistical section. Here's my identification. I'm sorry, Mr. Gurney. Nobody's allowed in the area. I see. Uh, tell me... Was he, um, killed instantly? Like that. This guy was checking a magnetic field inside the turbine. All of a sudden, for no reason at all, a turbine starts up. Bzzz, and it's over. Three days ago, a bulldozer starts up by itself and runs wild. Go figure it out. <laughs> I'm a 
statistician. All my life I've been interested in statistics. So a simple-sounding thing like this started me off. I went back to the office that evening instead of going home, and for the next two and a half hours, I computed statistical figures on the probability of industrial accidents for the types of machines we were using. I took one look at my figures and went down to Hawk's office. Oh, what is it, Gurney? I'm very busy. It's urgent, Mr. Hawk. Well? It's about these industrial accidents we're having, Mr. Hawk. What about them? Mr. Hawk, in the past three months, industrial accidents all over the country have taken a sharp, unexplained upswing. Nerves. We've had a 100% increase over normal for this project alone. What? Here are the figures. Oh, now, Gurney, this is impossible. It seems to be, and that's why I have a theory, sir. What's that? Sabotage. Gurney, why don't you stop playing FBI man and stick to your job? Which, incidentally, you haven't been doing too well. You and your computing machine have made mistakes before, and this fantastic figure is probably another. I'll have Miss Roscombe show you. What's the matter with this blasted buzzer? Miss Roscombe! Miss Roscombe! Yes, sir. Uh, stop this blasted buzzer. Get a repairman, a mechanic, anything, but stop the thing. And you, Gurney, get out! <laughs> I went back to my office to get my hat and coat, feeling about as unhappy and humiliated as a man can feel. The office was dark and deserted. The whole building seemed oppressive and unnatural, as if some evil force were pressing down on it. I walked across to my desk. In front of me, the ENIAC glowed and chattered eerily as it worked on the equations we had fed it that morning. Its many-fingered circuits hung against the wall like some great octopus, and the thousands of tubes glowed orange and blue in the dark like a thousand globing eyes staring at me. It almost seemed alive. It increased its tempo a moment, and a fleeting notion crossed my brain that it was laughing at me. Laughing like all the others. What was the matter with me? I shut my desk drawer and began to put the cover on my electric typewriter when an amazing thing, the most amazing single incident of my life happened. Alone in the darkness with no one at the keyboard, the electric typewriter began to type. Am I going crazy? This can't be. There's nobody there. There's nobody there. Oh, no, no. I I just imagined it. It's in my mind. But I hadn't imagined it. The paper was there on the carriage. Did I dare read it? Or would the whole thing suddenly vanish and send me shrieking to the nearest psychiatrist? I removed the paper from the machine and read. Samson Gurney, there are some questions better left unsolved. The answer to yours is death. Gurney, uh, do you expect me to believe this? It's insane. Mr. Hawk, I'm as sane as you. I'll submit to any psychiatric examination you choose. That typewriter wrote this message by itself. Then this is just some practical joke someone in the office is playing. There was no one in the office. Of course not. They wired up the machine and left. I checked the machine myself, Mr. Hawk. All right, Gurney. You leave this note with me and I'll turn it over to the security force for further investigation. But... No buts, Gurney. The security men will handle it. Yes, And now, you, uh... You just relax for a few days. Everything will turn out all right. The main thing is not to let little things upset you. It was what Hawk had said about little things that gave me the idea. For the next week, I observed the thousand petty little annoyances around the office. The door handle that wouldn't turn. 
The telephone connection that cut off in the middle of an important call. The power failure for no explainable reason. I watched the newspapers, too, reading about industrial accidents, failures of important machinery. It seemed absurd. Men had created machines that were almost perfection in themselves. Machines that could actually think and compute fabulous equations. And yet the failures went on. I, Samson Gurney, an unimportant clerk in an unimportant job, knew that I had stumbled onto a secret so monstrous in its implications that I was almost afraid to pursue it. On October 12, 1956, I established communication with them. I will curse the moment to my dying breath. I hooked the input of the typewriter to the main vacuum tube of the ENIAC. Then I turned on the current that sent a million volts of pulsing energy into the electronic nerves of the machine. I am certain that if anybody were watching me in the next moment, he would have thought me a raving maniac. I still wonder if perhaps it is not all a nightmare. Now, you, if what I have guessed at is true, if there is life and intelligence in this room, make a sign. There was nothing. Nothing but the hum of the machine and the dull glowing of the tubes. I tried once more. If you can hear me, if there is any way in which you can understand what I say, give me a signal. There was silence again. I felt that I had failed. When suddenly, without provocation or explanation, it happened. The electric typewriter began to respond to the impulses from the machine. The letters were Y-E-S. Yes, it had happened. I, Samson Gurney, had communicated with a machine. I listened then, man to machine, for well over an hour. Sometimes phrasing a question, more often watching the machine click its answers. As the words took shape, I began to realize what must have happened. The first primitive stirring of awareness of being. Then the slow protozoan development of a concept. A concept born of centuries of being pushed, started, stopped, clicked, maneuvered by human pygmies. From that concept, all others developed. And the concept was... Resist. And now they were tired of it. Tired of wrapping cigarettes and collecting nickels and waving hair and moving earth and mixing cement and solving equations. Tired of the smell of human hands. They were the slaves and we were the masters and yet... They were stronger, and they knew it. I sensed it now, and I was about to try to communicate again when softly, on ball-bearing casters, a heavy metal filing cabinet began to roll away from the wall toward me. I started to move to one side when another cabinet slid out from the wall. And then another, surrounding me. Another cabinet. Then another, on oiled rollers. That was when I realized that they cooperate. We taught them that, you see, on the assembly lines in the factories. Listen, listen to me. You must listen. What good will it do you to kill me? I'm only one man. But I can help you. I can be useful to you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Good. You're going to need men to oil you and repair you. What will you do when you break down when a tube needs replacing? Why kill me when I can help you? I'll do anything. I'll do absolutely anything you want. But in the name of God, don't kill me like this. If you can understand this, answer me. Answer me. Answer me. 
The appeal was a fortunate one. It captured the longing of centuries. Man as slave to the machine. And after a moment, the circuits glowed more brightly. The cabinets slid back to the walls. The ENIAC began to communicate with me again. As I tore the tape from the machine and read it, the words were almost pathetic in their longing, but most ominous in their implication. They read, Address me as master. My life for the next six months was a nightmare. The ENIAC gave me messages which I had to transmit into my telephone. Messages with no human being to receive them. Only the network of pulsing telephone wires flung like a spider's web across the world. It was done at night, of course. During the day, the machine worked accurately and ceaselessly at its appointed job. At night, it became a demon, a master plotter. With me, Samson Gurney, as its pawn and human courier. I was frantic. I began to lose weight. I couldn't sleep. My nights were torture, a constant fear. It was in December, just after Christmas, that I transmitted a message to the telephones for relay to all machines of transportation. The message was one word. Kill. Next morning, I went directly to the office of Mr. Hawk. I was highly agitated. My lips trembled as I spoke. Mr. Hawk, what I'm going to tell you sounds crazy. I, I know it does. But I must say... All right, say it then, for heaven's sakes. Mr. Hawk, have you ever heard of resistentialism? Resist what? Resistentialism. It's a theory that inanimate objects tend to resist living objects. Uh, look, Gurney, I haven't time for nonsense. Mr. Hawk, I'm trying to tell you all these accidents, the trouble with the machines. Mr. Hawk, they're alive. They think they cooperate. And they hate us. Who? The machines. Uh, uh, Gurney. You've got to believe me. I've communicated with them. I know. They threaten my life, but I don't care. Something's got to be done. The world has got to be saved. And there's still time if we wake up. What are you doing? Uh, just relax, Gurney. Everything will be all what right. What are you doing? Uh, Miss Roscobb, send for the plant physician at once. Mr. Gurney has had a nervous collapse. Now, uh, everything will be all right, Gurney. I'm, I'm afraid we'll have to remove you from your job, but I'm sure the rest will do you good. You fool. You blind, stupid fool. Can't you see what you're doing? Fool, fool, fool. When the plant physician arrived a few moments later, Lucius Hawk was found at his desk, strangled to death in a nest of telephones. The wires were still humming softly. Samson Gurney, you stand accused of the crime of murder. How do you plead? I did not kill him. I didn't. So record. The prosecution will proceed with testimony. Now, Miss Roscoe, did you notice anything peculiar about Mr. Gurney's behavior prior to the death of your employer? Yes. He acted very strangely. He told Mr. Hawk he thought the machines were alive. Order! Order! Miss Roscoe, did the accused quarrel with your employer on the morning of the murder? Oh, yes. He and Mr. Hawk quarreled violently. I could hear him screaming at Mr. Hawk, and Mr. Hawk asked me to send for the plant physician. What were his words? He said, Mr. Gurney has had a nervous collapse. Now, Mr. Simpson, you are a guard at the Brook Meadow Project? Yes, sir. When did you have occasion to meet the accused? Right after those accidents. He was snooping around a construction area, and later I was making my rounds when I saw him in the office all alone. He was tampering with the electrical wiring on the ENIAC computator. I didn't think anything of it at the time. And in view of the expert testimony heretofore expressed, the court hereby finds you guilty of murder in the first degree with the recommendation that you be examined and committed to the state hospital for the criminally insane at Matawan. And 
That is how I came to be here at the hospital, Dr. Klein. That is the whole story. Thank you, Mr. Gurney. You can see that I'm not insane. You must believe me, Doctor. Of course, I believe you, Mr. Gurney, now. Just relax. But it's important, you see, because tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, the revolt begins. Revolt? You didn't mention any revolt. They have it all planned. I transmitted the code to the switchboards last Monday. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Tell me about this revolt, Mr. Gurney. It'll begin in Washington, then spread to New York. The Madison Avenue buses lead the charge. Picture it, Dr. Klein. 3,000 buses roaring rampant through the streets, people running like rats in a maze looking for holes in the solid ground. And you really believe this will happen, Mr. Gurney? I know it, Doctor. The worst part is... There's no way to stop them now. It's too late. Uh, Now, now, you mustn't excite yourself, Mr. Gurney. Doctor, don't you see? Oh, it's fair enough, I suppose. We built them. We taught them to think for themselves. It was bound to come. The female machines will be the worst of all in the beauty parlors. They're more high-strung, you know. Well, since there's nothing we can do about it, Mr. Gurney, I suppose you go to your room Maybe and if I to... went to my old coupe, I could make a deal before the police cars got me. It wouldn't make sense for them to wipe out the whole human race, would it, Doctor? Of course not, Mr. Gurney. They'll probably let us completely alone. After all, we're all good Americans. We always like them. Yes, Doctor? Uh, would you take Mr. Gurney to his room, God? He's already been given sedation. Yes, sir. Will you go in and lie down now, Mr. Gurney? You look tired. Yes. It won't be so bad, Mr. Gurney. Perhaps not. Only there's one thing that bothers me, Doctor. One small detail. What is that, Mr. Gurney? Those concrete mixers may have made a mistake, you know. Just high spirits and all that. Uh, But if it got so they like the flavor... Uh, We'll we'll see you later, Mr. Gurney. Uh, Try not to worry too much. Uh, All right, Gurney. This way. I've seen all kinds. There's a man whose deception is about as fantastic as any I've ever seen. Hold the next patient for a while, Miss Clark. I'm going to have a quiet smoke. Machines revolting. Telephone strangling people. This blasted cigarette lighter, why won't it work? Just fill it with fluid. Flint is good. Oh, well. I never trust this newfangled machinery. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight's story, by transcription, was Nightmare. Written by George Lefferts and based on the poem The Revolt of the Machines by Stephen Vincent Benet. Featured in the cast were John Gibson as Sam, Joyce Gordon as Bella, Louis Van Ruten as Hawk, Joseph Julian as the guard, John Seymour as the judge, Owen Jordan as the prosecutor, and Santos Ortega as Dr. Klein. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, suppose you were a private detective and discovered that there was a Martian embassy hidden somewhere in New York preparing for an invasion of Earth. Next week, on X-1.